Right, ladies and gentlemen. Can I call you to order? Uh, welcome, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to people who are watching on the live stream or indeed a recorded version of the live stream. Um, my name's Julian Andrews. I'm not the head of school. I'm standing in for the head of school today. Um, but I was the head of school and I've also recently been organising a number of events that celebrate EMS School of Environmental Science uh, 50th anniversary. Um, I'm just going to say a few words about the idea behind the Zuckerman lecture and then I'll hand over to Andrew Manning who will introduce the speaker. Um, so the name Zuckerman uh, from Sir or Baron uh, Solly Zuckerman who was a very highly accomplished scientist, a biologist, uh, but also a public servant. He uh, served government from the 1940s uh, onwards, uh, not least as a role which became chief scientific advisor, that's what you call it today, to the government, particularly to Harold Wilson's government in the early 1960s, but throughout the 1960s. Uh, and at about this time, in the, in the late 50s, early 60s, he was also part of an advisory board at the nascent uh, University of East Anglia. He was a part of the setup to um, think about how the new university would run and, and how, it might, uh, how it might look. And perhaps his lasting influence at UEA uh, was his grand idea, um, amazingly perceptive in the early 1960s and quite radical uh, at that time to set up a school of environmental sciences, an integrated school uh, that studied the environment. Um, and that idea was realised in 1968 when the first students were admitted to the school. So the first students uh, uh, would have been at the end of their first year, right now 50 years ago. Uh, and the school has celebrated the, the, the association with Lord Zuckerman uh, in uh, a long running series of Zuckerman research symposia uh, and the most recent of these was last year uh, where we celebrate the successes of the school uh, in its first 50 years in particular. Um, and at each of those uh, meetings we kind of refresh our commitment to interdisciplinary environmental sciences, uh, very much the hallmark of Zuckerman's vision. So it's in this spirit that the school has decided to establish uh, an annual lecture uh, in the name of Solly Zuckerman. Um, and it's our great pleasure that uh, Professor Ralph Keeling has accepted the Vice-Chancellor's invitation to give this inaugural Zuckerman lecture. So I'm going to hand over now to Andrew Manning, who's going to introduce the speaker. Thanks. Hi everyone, it's really great to see such a good turnout today, despite um, the horrendous weather we've been having. I've been trying to tell Ralph this is not normal Norwich weather. Um, so I'm a member of the Faculty of School of Environmental Sciences here at UEA, and I've known Ralph for almost 30 years, which is quite scary how old that I'm getting. And I was his very first PhD student back in the 1990s. But before I let Ralph start his lecture, I wanted to share with you a story of the first time I met him. It was in 1990 in New Zealand, my home country. And I just completed my undergraduate degree and I had a summer job working on methane extraction from ice cores. And Ralph was visiting us, having just set up the Cape Grim Tasmania sampling station in Australia, which I'm sure we're gonna see some data from in his talk today, possibly. When Ralph was introduced to me, the first thing he said was, you must have the same problem I have. I had no clue what he meant by this. So when he was gone, I asked my boss, what did he mean? My boss said, he means that you have a famous father working in the same field as you, just like him. And I said, oh really? Who's his father? <laughs> At that time, I knew nothing about environmental sciences and had never heard of Dave Keeling or the Keeling Curve. What I also didn't know is that Dave Keeling worked very closely with my father uh, to set up CO2 measurements at Bering Head, New Zealand, which is the world's second longest running continuous CO2 measurement station after Mauna Loa, Hawaii. The so-called problem that both Ralph and I had was when we met someone new at a conference or meeting, they would very frequently say to us, oh, you're Dave Keeling's son, 
or, oh, you're Martin Manning's son. And this was both annoying and we didn't really know how to respond to that point. So a couple of years after the first time I met Ralph, and before I started my PhD with him, I was at an international conference and an older gentleman sat down next to me. I took a glance at his name badge and it said Dave Keeling. So I turned to him and said, oh, you must be Ralph Keeling's father. <laughs> he uh, was, looked very flustered and didn't know what to say and he looked at my name badge and he said, wait a minute, you're... And then he stopped and he realised he couldn't complete that sentence. <laughs> I'm quite pleased to be able to say that now Ralph and I don't have this problem anymore. So the Keating legacy to environmental sciences is truly phenomenal. The first high-position atmospheric CO2 measurements, the first high-position atmospheric oxygen measurements, the longest-running CO2 and oxygen measurements, the most extensive global network of oxygen measurements. But it's not just the measurements. Both Keelings have continually been at the forefront of advancing our knowledge and understanding of the carbon cycle and climate change. So I hope you will join me now in welcoming Ralph to learn about some of this. So thank you, Andrew, and thank, thanks to all of you for inviting me here. This is really a, an honor to be able to talk to you and set in motion uh, a lecture series, which I, I hope is uh, <clears throat> worthy of my introductory lecture. I mean, I'm sorry, other way around. I hope my introductory lecture is worthy of the series that, <laughs> that will follow. Um, to, to Andrew's point about having a problem coming in the same field as your father, there was a, a colleague of his, not Andrew's father, I think, around the same time. He said, oh, don't worry. Eventually, you'll get credit for everything he did. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think I try pretty hard not to let that happen, but I do find myself having to speak for him now, as I, as I will tonight. Um, so I, I have hosted and given a number of lectures on climate change <clears throat> over the last few years, and they usually follow a pattern, and I have to say that I, I decided not to follow that pattern. <clears throat> And the pattern is, and it's, it, this, this is an important issue, and this is the pattern that's dictated by the importance of this issue, is that you start by outlining all the ways the climate system is impacted by human activities, mostly in pretty serious ways. So sea level rise, you have increase in storms, you have increase in wildfires, you have populations threatened, you have places on the world that may get too hot for humans to live. You look at model forecasts that show, wow, this is not going in a good direction. Um, we got to do something about this. We probably have to act pretty fast in order to avert pretty serious consequences. And even though that's hard, it's possible. And uh, maybe there's opportunities and fun to be had along the way. Let's try to look at this as a challenge and not a great threat. So um, that's not the talk I'm going to give. <clears throat> although I tried to indicate that I'm sympathetic to the issue. Uh, I'm going to give a talk here that's a little more, more singularly about my own experience as a scientist working in this field and, and my father working in this field. And I, I therefore will not do justice uh, to the, the scope of the science in many ways. I may not even do justice to the scope of achievements of, of people in closely related fields, although I'll, I'll do my best to touch on it. Um, so... <clears throat> So I'll start with my father's story. Here's a picture of him as a young man in front of a, a river in the Sierra Nevada mountain range. So he, he started measuring carbon dioxide in the late 1950s. And he came from a background in, uh, with a PhD in polymer chemistry. Uh, and uh, he went out west to, to, to pursue a, a degree at a postdoc at Caltech in uh, uh, the ge geosciences or geology department, uh, by his own account, for no reason particularly better than his love of the outdoors. He loved the mountains, and he was closer to them out there, and geosciences put him closer to the outdoors than polymer chemistry. <clears throat> he was given a project to study carbon in rivers. Why was that interesting and important? Only because it hadn't been done before. So this was the era of the great expansion of science into new frontiers. No one knew whether it would be important or not. It just hadn't been done and therefore was of interest. 
In the course of working on that, he realized that he needed to measure carbon dioxide in the air in order to understand at least that one control and a significant control on the, on the level in the, in, the, in the rivers or in river water. <clears throat> and uh, he invested in making improved measurements of carbon dioxide in the air using liquid nitrogen to extract the CO2 and measuring the volume of CO2 with a very precise technique called a manometer. He, in fact, for no really good reason did he invest in this method because simpler methods that had been used before might have sufficed for his purposes, but it was possible he was just having fun. Um, uh, not too long into this project, his interest shifted from the rivers to the atmosphere because in the course of doing measurements of air, he discovered some things that hadn't been noticed before. He was not the first person to measure CO2 in air. There was probably almost 150 years of scientists measuring CO2, mostly physiologists who would do things like putting mice in bell jars and seeing what the mouse did to the, did, did to the jar, and they would measure the CO2 before they put it in the jar, and so they'd have to measure the CO2 outside where they got the air. So there was lots and lots of measurements of that sort. And the impression from those earlier measurements was that carbon dioxide was quite variable. You could get levels ranging from 300 all the way up to 400 parts per million, and there was no real rhyme or reason for why it was doing what it did. What he noticed, probably for the first time because he had a better measurement, <clears throat> was that there was regularity to it. He could see a very clear day-night cycle in the forests where he was doing most of his early measurements. And the afternoon values were relatively similar from place to place. He showed that the afternoon values were almost the same as he got on the top of mountains and on ships. He realized that once you got away from local influences, that the atmosphere actually had tremendous regularity. There was almost a constant level of CO2 in the air. Now, he wasn't thinking much about the climate problem then, but other people were. And there was already a program being spun up to try to measure carbon dioxide as part of the International Geophysical Year, which was a great program to go out and study all sorts of aspects of the Earth, mostly motivated by Cold War kind of concerns about radio communications and solar activity and such. Um, and he was called upon to make these measurements because he had this improved technology. And um, he, the, the background of the science of climate change at that point, you already had the, the study of Arrhenius back in the late 19th century who had shown that the buildup of carbon dioxide quite possibly could influence climate. Um, but in the intervening years, not much had happened because the field basically went through a phase where it was discredited, or at least not paid attention to because it was not viewed as being significant. And there were two primary reasons it was discounted. One was <clears throat> that even though humans were known to be releasing CO2 to the atmosphere, the, the idea was that the oceans were so vast that they ought to be able to soak it up so it wouldn't build up in the atmosphere. The other concern was that even if it did build up, the effect of the CO2 on the radiation and therefore the greenhouse effect would be minor because the big greenhouse gas was water vapor and it would overwhelm the effect of CO2. So it, it shouldn't build up and even if it didn't, wouldn't matter. Now there were a few skeptics at that time, including a British engineer named Guy Stewart Callender who wrote a series of papers arguing that no, actually maybe it will build up and actually it probably could have an effect on climate if it did so. Um, and by the time my father moved into this field, two really important papers building in part uh, on the calendar work um, had just been published. One was a paper by Gilbert Plass that showed that the water vapor overlap was not stopping CO2 from having a big effect, mainly because when you get up higher in the atmosphere, there's not that much water. Um, it's dried out. So the up, up in the atmosphere where you really have an effect on climate, the CO2 could make a difference. And another paper by Roger Ravel, the director of Scripps Institution of Oceanography, that pointed out that the emissions of CO2 should cause the atmosphere to build up, atmospheric CO2 to build up. The oceans wouldn't take it all up or wouldn't take so much up that it wasn't an issue. So there was already a theoretical basis for concern. What we didn't have was proof that it actually was building up. And that's where my father came in. He was very interested in making measurements in different places, including at the Monolo Observatory. This is an early, early slide of him using liquid nitrogen, actually a later slide, but showing the method. So what's special about Mauna Loa 
is that it's a long way from cities and forests. It's a mountain in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's quite high. Uh, the, the top is over 3,000 meters. So imagine just a great big pole in the middle of the ocean, sampling deep into the remote atmosphere. It was a beautiful place to probe this background of CO2 to see whether it was actually changing. Um, <clears throat> now, things started out fine. He turned on the instrument, and lo and behold, this is the first month of data in 1958, he got almost exactly the background value he expected. Triumph, except that the generator broke, <clears throat> and it was down for a while, and then when it came back on, oops, it started off lower and was drifting downwards. Ugh, something didn't make sense. And then the generator broke again, and then when it came back on, it was even lower still, but now drifting upwards. This looked like something that was going wrong with the instrument. Something was drifting in the instrument. Something was, something was messed up. He didn't know, so this was not happy. <clears throat> but he didn't know how to fix it, and he left it running. And then the generator was more reliable for a while, and he, see, he saw it came up, and then it came down again. Right around in here, he realized what was going on. Ah! It's just going up and down with the seasons. This isn't a broken instrument. This is what's actually going on in the world's atmosphere. There's a seasonal cycle in carbon dioxide. You can see, and it made sense. In the summertime, carbon dioxide is decreasing. Plants are taking it up by photosynthesis. And the rest of the year, you can see the carbon dioxide coming back into the atmosphere, released from presumably soils or trees or respiring, putting it back when the light levels are low or colder causing it to build back up again, it's a regular seasonal cycle. So that was the first big discovery here. And, but the precision of these was such that in a, in a matter of a couple of years, they could show that carbon dioxide indeed was rising. It had the effect of actually organizing a research program around this problem. People realized, oh, if it's building up, we really have to understand its effect on climate. So there was investment in that. Um, and and the, the sort of whole field got of global change and, and, and Science got set in motion. So here we, here we continue it. So now here's the full record, going pretty much all the way to present. Um, and this is based on measurements at Hawaii. This is not the only place carbon dioxide is being measured. There's, there's at this point, certainly 100 or more sites, probably close to 1,000 sites where it's being measured. But this is still the flagship record because it's the most precise record going back. And it, it, it documents a whole range of phenomenon. If you can see the rise in CO2, you can see the seasonal cycle, there's fluctuations in other time scales. Um, in addition, a big development from the 1980s and continuing to present was the ability to recover air from ice cores, uh, ancient air or old air, to, to extend the record back in time. Um, and here's the Mauna Loa record now tacked onto an ice core record that goes back to, what, about 1700. And you can see that the levels had already risen by the time my father started. In fact, they started rising all the way back shortly after 1800. This is the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, releasing carbon dioxide, so it, the, the, the pattern makes sense. You can go further back. You can go back around 10,000 years. You can see that the, the levels were quite constant for a long period of time. This is almost a whole lapse of human civilization. Levels range between about 260 and maybe 280 parts per million. Here they are rocketing up at the end of the record. You can go further back and you see the ice age cycles with lower levels and glaciers and glacial periods and higher levels and interglacial periods. So this last period here of 10,000 years was an interglacial, one of these high bumps that we've now boosted on top of. Um, and in the last decade or so, with uh, still uh, difficulty, you can go even further back not with ice cores, because the oldest ice that we've got good records out of so far only goes back 800,000 years, but you can go back with other methods of inferring CO2, looking at leaves, ancient leaves, looking at isotopes and carbonate deposits um, <clears throat> and other things. And you can see that the levels we have now, slightly over 400 parts per million, last existed something like three million years ago in a period called the Pliocene, when, when the world was quite different, sea levels were 10, 20 meters higher than today, big changes in vegetation. Um, and we will soon be moving into territory well above 400 parts per million, where the last time the Earth had levels that high were tens of millions of years ago, um, back in the Oligocene or Eocene. Um, so what else can we say about this? So one of the issues early on, in, once you showed CO2 was rising, was to understand exactly why it's rising at the rate it's rising. And the first 
interesting benchmark to compare it to is to compare it to how fast it should rise if nothing <coughs> else went on except fossil fuel burning. And that's what this yellow curve shows. So the, you start at the same level in 1958, and you say, this is how much the atmosphere would have risen by fossil fuel burning alone. The calculation's not hard, because we know how much fossil fuel is being burnt every year quite well, and we know how big the atmosphere is. It's a bucket. We're dumping water into it. You can figure out how fast it should fill up. Similarly here, we're dumping CO2 into the atmosphere. You can figure out how fast it would fill up. And what you see, of course, is that the rise rate is significant, but it's less than you would get if all the CO2 stayed in the air. So that means carbon dioxide is going elsewhere. And for several decades after my father made these first measurements, he and other scientists went into trying to figure out what was causing that difference between the fossil fuel curve and the actual rise rate. And by the mid-1970s, uh, this was the kind of uh, inferences that were available. So you had um, the, the increase was being measured. I've lost this. There. Um, the increase rate was measured. That's the 2.7 number. That's, these are now in different units. These are in billions of tons of carbon per year. But they could equally well be expressed in parts per million per year. Um, and you see the fossil fuel burning num number, 5.2. Uh, the oceanographers had an inference of how much uh, uh, was going into the ocean, about 1.9. Didn't quite add up. And it was recognized that land plants could possibly play a role also in taking up carbon dioxide. And by difference, you, you get something like 0.6 going into the land. So you know the fossil fuel burning. You know the atmospheric increase. You make some guesstimate about how much is going into the ocean. And you fur the land where you have even a weaker basis for making the estimate. Um, now. Uh, and this is about the point I entered the field. This, this work was now in the, in, in only a few years in the background. A paper came out in the late 70s by a group of ecologists. They were terrestrial ecologists. And what was special about that is that terrestrial ecologists hadn't weighed in on this topic before. These are people who studied forests. Previously, it was people like my father who measured CO2 or oceanographers like Wally Broker, actually a really important scientist who just passed away in the last, the last few months. Um, he and my father and others were, were, were making these inferences about atmosphere and ocean and fossil fuel. But the ecologists said, hey, no, when we look at ecosystems, we don't see them taking up carbon. What we see is destruction. We see forests being cut down. We see forests being burnt. We see slash burn agriculture. When you destroy ecosystems, you burn it, you release carbon. So instead of having the land be a sink, it actually should be a source. Now, if you put this here and you say, OK, well, 4 out of 8 are coming from the land, 5.2 are coming from fossil fuel burning, only 2.7 are going into the atmosphere, and the oceanographer thinks that 1.9 is going into the ocean, it just badly doesn't add up. Something is wrong with this budget. Um, and the oceanographers fought back, saying, no, our number is good. Um, the, the, the initially, the, the ecologists, uh, their insights were refined by other uh, people in the field. And the, 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 they realized the numbers weren't as big as they thought, but they settled down to a number around two. And by that time, it was already starting to be accepted that, yes, these things were all more or less right, except that. There's a lot of a land biosphere that wasn't being touched by humans, and it must be taking up the rest of this. Now, this was very controversial, the, the idea that undisturbed ecosystems would be absorbing lots of carbon dioxide. You might ask, why is that difficult? Well, OK, um, trees photosynthesize, plants photosynthesize, and when they do, they take up carbon dioxide. So why, can't, why is it surprising that the ecosystems would take up carbon dioxide? Well, OK, here here's shows what happened. Here's, suppose you start with bare ground and you grow a plant. That process takes up atmospheric CO2. That carbon that got taken out of the air didn't disappear. It's right there in the tree. Carbon is conserved. You take CO2 out of the air by photosynthesis. You put it in the tree, in the biomass. Now, that might happen if you had a tree farm with lots of trees, but a forest, you've got older trees that are dying and decaying and decomposing. So you don't just have growth, you have decay. Both are going on. That releases the CO2 back. And in a forest where both are going on at equal rates, sure, carbon cycling back and forth. But from the standpoint of the atmosphere, it's a do-nothing loop. 
carbon dioxide will come out during photosynthesis. It comes back during decay. The cycle of life, including photosynthesis and decay, won't take CO2 out of the atmosphere. So in order to have this sink, you had to have something that was breaking the cycle of life, something quite unusual going on, stimulating undisturbed ecosystems to absorb carbon. Now that's not impossible because things were changing all over the planet. Carbon dioxide is rising in the atmosphere. That's known to fertilize plants. Seasons are getting longer because of warming. It wasn't out of the question, but it was quite controversial. So this is the problem that I came in on board to try to help answer. Could we challenge this and show whether this was really going on? And the main way to get around it would be if this 1.9 number, number for the oceans were somehow underestimated. <clears throat> if the oceans were taking up more and maybe the land use emissions were overestimated, maybe there were one instead of two, and maybe fossil fuel burning was also a little bit overestimated, you could maybe get that residual sink, this undisturbed ecosystem sink, down much smaller, in which case it's, it would have been a figment of the imagination and not an element of reality. So what the method that we brought to bear was to look at another component in the atmosphere, namely oxygen. Now, carbon dioxide is a trace gas. It's present at 400 parts per million or something like this in the atmosphere. That's out of a million molecules 400 of them are CO2. Oxygen is a major component of air. It's about 21%. So out of a million air molecules, 210,000 of them are oxygen. So there wasn't so much a concern that oxygen would be changing in a big way, but it would carry diagnostic information if you could measure it. You could measure it changing. So previously, no one had tried to measure it because there was so much of it, it was you oh, you can't possibly see changes in something that's so vast little tiny changes. <clears throat> but where oxygen helps you here is that um, to the extent land plants are taking up CO2, they have to be producing oxygen, right? Photosynthesis takes up CO2, it produces oxygen back. In fact, the oxygen is returned as a direct measure of the gain in the biomass. It's part of the same equation there. That's the, the chemistry of photosynthesis. Um, and to the extent that you had land use destroying biomass, it would be going in the other direction. Both of those affect oxygen, essentially one-to-one -one with carbon. So to that extent, oxygen should just be the flip side of carbon. Every time CO2 went up, oxygen should go down, one-to-one. -one. Now fossil fuel burning also takes up oxygen. It turns out it takes up slightly more than one oxygen per carbon dioxide. Why? Because some of the fuel is in forms like petroleum and natural gas, and when you look at the exhaust of your car, it's got a lot of water in it. That water that actually came from hydrogen in the fuel is actually consuming more oxygen. So there's something like 50% more oxygen consumed, but the point is we know how much fossil fuel is being burnt. We can actually calculate the oxygen loss as well. So the idea here was to measure the change in oxygen, correct for fossil fuel, and then we would get the net effect on land of the carbon flows. And by you could also infer the ocean uptake from, from, from the balance. <clears throat> um, another way to say this about the ocean, there's another way to get, oh, uh, let, let me say, say this. Uh, the ocean uptake does not involve oxygen because it doesn't involve photosynthesis. The ocean takes up CO2 because there's acid-base chemistry in the ocean. The CO2 effectively reacts with pre-existing carbonate ions, these the, like CO3, 2 minus and forms bicarbonate. There's acid-base chemistry. The ocean is getting more acidic because of that. That's something you may have heard about. Um, but there's no oxygen involved in that reaction. <clears throat> so you don't expect that ocean sink to be directly tied to any effect in oxygen. Um, let's see here. So uh, this comes important for another piece of the talk. There's another way of getting, getting, getting the ocean sink um, from oxygen measurements. And <clears throat> it's the same uh, approach, just explained differently. And that comes about by looking at the sum of oxygen and CO2. If you can measure CO2 in the atmosphere and you can measure oxygen in the atmosphere, you could add those two numbers together and get the total amount of both. I mean, you could, you could imagine you had a, a, a farm with chickens and a farm with ducks, and you know how many ducks you have, and you know how many chickens you have, and therefore you know how many ducks plus chickens you have. And you could look at changes in the number of ducks plus chickens. So that's what we get. We got CO2 measurements, we got oxygen measurements, we're measuring the sum. The nice thing about the sum is that it's not influenced by anything going on on land, because every time you gain a CO2, you lose an oxygen or vice versa. So it's a do-nothing. 
Fossil fuel burning does affect the sum because there's slightly more than one oxygen loss per CO2. Um, <clears throat> and the ocean uptake of CO2 would affect the sum because it's taking away CO2 but not pr producing oxygen back. So the way to get, another way to get the sink is to measure the sum, correct for the fossil fuel influence on the sum, and then you can get the ocean influence, which is the ocean influence on CO2. So we started making measurements uh, around 1990. Um, and this is the network that Andrew mentioned, where we get st samples from. Um, and here's an example of some of our data from two stations. Uh, Alert Station, which is in the Northern Hemisphere, um, like Mauna Loa is in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and then that's the, that's the Black Station, the, the record in black. And then uh, Cape Grimm Station in the Southern Hemisphere, where I had just been when I was uh, visiting Andrew. Uh, is in red. <clears throat> the lowest plot there uh, is just carbon dioxide levels. So you can see the black curve looks a bit like the Mauna Loa record. It's got the seasonal cycle and it's increasing. The southern hemisphere also is increasing. The middle panel shows the trends measured in oxygen. So you can see oxygen is decreasing as expected from fossil fuel burning and uh, possibly modulated by the land. Um, and you can see it going down in both the north and the south. And then I'm also plotting up there on the top the sum of the two concentrations. Our interest here is in these long-term trends, so I will basically suppress the seasonality and combine the two records. Oops, I was going to say something else here. Well, let me, well, let me, let me jump to, I'll jump back to this. So stick on course here. Um, so here's, here's those records now shown as just single lines for each species, and it's of interest to compare those to the fossil fuel lines. So just like I did before for CO2, you can see the trends expected from fossil fuel alone. You can now do the same thing for oxygen, and you can do the same thing for the sum on top. So CO2 is going up slower than you expect from fossil fuel burning. Oxygen in the middle, in the brown curve, is falling slower than expected from fossil fuel burning. And the sum is decreasing faster than expected from fossil fuel burning. So you can look at these wedges and, and, and come pick, pick out the different influences. That wedge right there is just the increase in CO2. It's how fast that brown curve is increasing. That difference there has to be the combined processes that are taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, you can do that for oxygen here. What can be replacing oxygen that's lost by fossil fuel burning. The oceans can't do it. The land must be doing it. If it's doing it, it's taking up CO2. So that gives you a measure of the land sink. You're separating land and ocean here. And the difference between the, the, uh, the trend in, uh, in the sum and the, uh, the trend expected from fossil fuel alone, that has to be due to the mm -hmm. oceans. So, and those, those two upper wedges will add up to the lower wedge. So we, we basically balance the budgets. Um, <clears throat> now maybe a, a diversion here. We're showing that oxygen's decreasing in the atmosphere. Should you be worried? Does anyone care about oxygen? <laughs> Would you care if this room had a lot less oxygen in it? You might. OK, so should we worry? And the numbers matter here. So let me back up to this slide here. OK, so this is a, an attempt to give you a feeling for magnitude, how much stuff is out there. So each circle represents an amount of this thing. So this is basically how much CO2 we would have in the atmosphere at 400 parts per million. 10 years of fossil fuel burning would add about that much more to it. Um, and you can compare that to the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. A lot more oxygen in the atmosphere. 10 years of fossil fuel burning would take a, a, a dent out about that big. So 10 years of fossil fuel burning, and especially 10 years, 10 years, 10 years, 10 years, you get a pretty big effect on CO2, but you're still only making a tiny dent in atmospheric oxygen. I'm not aware of significant physiological impacts of that, and talking to physiologists, I can't, can't, can't find anyone who actually thinks this is an environmental issue. Oxygen is important because it's a diagnostic, not because it's an environmental threat. We are losing oxygen. Uh, but we're losing it at too small a rate to matter. And furthermore, even at the point we've used up all fossil fuels, we won't have made that big a dent in oxygen. We will, however, at that point have overwhelmed the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. So we have the potential to vastly change CO2 in the atmosphere. We only have the potential to make rather small and almost certainly uh, 
uh, insignificant changes in atmospheric oxygen. So no, we shouldn't worry, but we can learn something from it. So we learned about these sinks. <clears throat> this, is, this is basically a budget informed by these oxygen measurements and, and other work by other colleagues and other methods. This is from a report from the IPCC that came out a few years ago. Um, so it's just summarizing what I showed you before. It also brings in the, the, the complication due to land use, which I uh, glossed over in those earlier slides. Uh, you can show these as a function of time as well. Now, our measurements don't go back all the way into the 19th century, but it turns out that if you know the ocean sink now, you can pretty well project it back in time because we understand the mechanism pretty well. It involves this chemistry of the seawater. It involves how well the oceans mix. Um, you can model that. You can make sure your models agree with the recent stuff, and so you can project back, and that means you can do this decomposition over time. And at the point I started doing the measurements, uh, this is kind of where we ended up. We did see a significant sink. So getting back to the earlier question, did we find a way to get rid of this sink of carbon, this surprising sink of carbon on land? The answer was no. It was emphatically no. We needed, uh, we needed that land sink to explain the oxygen effect. We needed that to, to, affect, to, to explain the, the, the effect on the sum. Um, and what's happened since then has been even more telling because if you look at since then, the sink has only gotten bigger. I'm looking at this green wedge here. That's this residual land sink. And it's, so the sinks are down. The sources are upwards. They add to total. That's why there's a symmetry there. Um, so the, the magnitude of that green wedge is how much carbon is going in each year. So ecosystems are changing on Earth, and they're taking up carbon in lots of places. They have to be doing that to explain what's going on here. And it's probably mostly in forests. So one thing we infer from the atmosphere already is big changes in the land biosphere in a kind of unexpected way. Um, now, we also see other evidence of big changes on land. And let me talk about that. So the Mauna Loa record shows the overall increase. But as I pointed out earlier, it has a seasonal cycle. right? It goes up and down. And that's a measure of carbon coming in and out of the land on a seasonal basis. If you look closely, maybe closer than you can possibly see by eye, you'll see that the wiggles go up and down a little bit more at the end of the record than they do at the beginning. So that it, 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 the overall curve is rising, but the, the up and down oscillation is also getting a little bit bigger. Now, it turns out that there's about a 15% increase in the amplitude here. But you see a much bigger change in amplitude if you look at stations further north. And the best record we have. Uh, further north that goes back to the, the 60s is from Barrow, Alaska, on the north slope of Alaska, um, where there are measurements starting, as I said, in the 60s. And you can see there, there's, now look at the red part. That's, that's just the arrow shows you how much the amplitudes have increased. There's a really substantial increase in amplitude there. Also at La Jolla, by the way, my home institution, UC San Diego, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, is in La Jolla. So these are measurements made right at home. Uh, first by my father and then continuing. There's also a very big increase in amplitude. Um, and uh, we know now from aircraft measurements that were also made by my father compared to more recently that this is a widespread change. Um, it's something like a 50% increase over 50 years. So it's going up almost a percent per year. So the amplitude is going up almost as fast in relative terms as CO2 itself is going up. Um, what's causing this? Well. It doesn't prove, because the amplitude's going up, that CO2 is taking up carbon, that the land is taking up carbon over the long run, because it's just an oscillation. And so you, just because you have waves doesn't mean the tide is rising. Um, but still, the waves are getting bigger, so something's changing. And um, the jury is still out on what's causing this. But the best evidence is that it's mostly driven by an increase in photosynthesis. So the most striking feature of this cycle in CO2 is the rapid drawdown in summer. And that rapid drawdown is increasing, and that's driven by photosynthesis. So um, the most uh, parsimonious explanation is that there's been something like a 50% increase in photosynthesis in the systems that are driving these cycles. And where is that cycle mostly driven? It's driven by boreal and temperate forests in the northern hemisphere. So the vast forests of Siberia, maybe also North America, they're probably growing at a rate that's something like 50% more in the summer than they were 50 years ago. That's pretty staggering. 
Um, there's other evidences of big, big increases in, in, in photosynthesis. Um, and I won't talk in any detail about, about this, but you can also measure changes in a gas that's a lot like carbon dioxide, but you substitute one of the oxygens for a sulfur. That's called carbonyl sulfide. It's much less abundant in the atmosphere. But it's also impacted by photosynthesis, and you can see changes in, in, the, in its abundance in the atmosphere over time that suggest similarly rapid increases in photosynthesis, in this case globally. Um, there's another uh, indicator of changes that comes from measuring uh, isotopes of carbon. Carbon isn't just one isotope. They're, they're isotope. What's an isotope? You can have a carbon atom and you can add a neutron to the nucleus. And it's still a carbon atom, but it's a little heavier. Uh, and that would be the normal carbon is carbon-12, unusual carbon is carbon-13. We measure the relative abundance of those, and they, t they tell us something about the carbon going in and out of leaves. And um, we can infer from that <clears throat> that over time, plants are needing less and less water to support the same amount of growth. A leaf has a complicated task. It's got to take in CO2 without drying out. The same holes that let in the CO2 can let the water out. And so it adjusts the size of those holes to try to find an optimum. And what we see is that plants are able to build higher CO2 in the air. They're able to make the holes a little smaller, wasting less water. You expect that, and we see evidence for it. Um, these are, the, all these things are consistent with quite a large CO2 fertilization effect, as though plants were, were growing significantly faster. Um, this is still unsettled science, so I think we have to acknowledge that there are other factors that might limit this effect. For example, warming might cause plants to grow slower or lose carbon. There could be other nutrients that are limiting and so on and so forth. Yet, what seems to show from the atmosphere is big changes in the direction of CO2 fertilization. And an example um, of where things might possibly be headed, I mean, beheading is, is, is to look at the last time carbon dioxide levels in the, in the atmosphere were as high as they are now. That's back in the Pliocene I mentioned before. It was a warmer period. One thing striking about the Pliocene is that <clears throat> the places like Barrow, Alaska, where you have tundra today on the North Slope, were covered with boreal forests back then. So you had forest extending much further north, vastly different coverage of vegetation. So one can imagine that the Pliocene would have had much higher CO2 amplitudes and that we're in some ways heading towards a world that's a little bit more like the Pliocene in that respect. Um, and the atmosphere seems to be telling a story like that. So I pivot now to talk about the ocean. So I, what, is the, what do we see about the land? We see these big changes in, in, in process. We see photosynthesis increasing probably. We see carbon being stored for sure. Um, what can we say about the oceans? Now, I mentioned this before, and you've probably heard about it, but one of the things that people are worried about is as is, is is seawater takes up CO2, uh, you change the chemistry and you change it in a way that it becomes more acidic, and that's bad, that's harmful for some kinds of organisms and could have effect on life in the ocean, uh, particularly for organisms that grow shells made out of calcium carbonate. Um, and can we see any indication of that from the atmosphere? Now, you can go to coral reefs and see that they're being hammered today, all right? We can't see that from the air, but what the beautiful thing about looking at the atmosphere is you get a big picture. Maybe is there something going on holistically at the level of the whole planet that shows up? Now, where, where can we say something about that? Um, so let's go back to these are our measured trends, CO2 at the bottom, oxygen in the middle, and the sum on top. And I want to now focus again on the sum. So recall what this is. This is, a, this, is, this is the chicken plus the ducks. It's the sum of oxygen and CO2. It's not impacted by land because photosynthesis on land produces oxygen and takes CO2 away and vice versa. But it is affected by, by uptake of CO2 by the oceans and it's affected by anything else that's driving oxygen and CO2 in or out of the oceans. And you can see it has a cycle we didn't talk about this before, but the sum also has a cycle. That's not photosynthesis on land because that doesn't touch it. And it turns out that it's quite clear that that cycle in this sum is mostly driven by oxygen being breathed in and out of the ocean seasonally. So 
in the summertime, in the ocean, just like on land, you get kind of a bloom, things grow, oxygen comes out. The other time of year, there's water being churned and things don't grow as fast, oxygen goes back in. We're seeing that cycle showing up in the atmosphere. Um, but do we see that cycle changing? And the answer is not much. So over that same period, we would have seen a significant increase in the cycle of carbon coming from land. We do not see such a significant change in oxygen from the ocean. There's probably, if anything, a little bit of a decrease, not unexpected, but it's, it's subdued in comparison. So from this indicator, life in the ocean is seemingly less impacted, at least on these large scales, as is life, land, land life. And there is one big difference. Uh, plants in the ocean don't need stomata because they're living in the water. They can't dry out, right? Land plants can dry out, so they need their stomata, and the higher CO2 helps them do that. The life in the ocean doesn't care as much. So maybe that's the difference here. We don't know. But in any case, we don't see a big indication there. Um, there is one other thing we can, we can look at, though. We can look at this trend. And this is going to get, this is, this is most, my most complicated point, and then it gets easier again, so bear with me. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so we, we talked about this trend in the sum, and I showed you before that you could compare it to the trend expected from fossil fuel burning. And the difference between that was a measure of how fast the ocean was taking up CO2. All right, this is review. You probably forgot it. I excuse you. This is not so easy stuff. Um, but it turns out, of course, this isn't the only way to get a handle on how much carbon dioxide is going into the ocean. There are other methods, and it's useful to compare them. And in particular, the most powerful method that you can compare against this one looks at the mechanism for which the ocean takes up CO2 and it really quantifies what's going on. And the, the, the most crucial thing to get the uptake estimate by the ocean is to know how fast the ocean's mixing. So the, 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 the chemistry is well known. CO2 is going in because there's a, the atmosphere's gone up. There's a, the thing is out of equilibrium. The surface layer of the ocean tends to equilibrate. And then how much the old ocean takes up is a function of how fast it mixes. Uh, and the beautiful thing is that we can look at how fast the ocean mixes by looking at other human-produced pollutants that are spreading from the atmosphere into the ocean, particularly the chlorofluorocarbons. And this is just a profile down here. It's a little bit of a... This is like a curtain through the ocean, and you can see the excess CFC-12, chlorofluorocarbon-12, in the surface penetrating into the interior. You can use that to quantify the rates of, of uptake. And that gives you, you can scale that, in effect, to get the uptake of CO2, and you can then do another estimate of what should be happening to O2 plus CO2 based on fossil fuel plus this other estimate of ocean CO2 uptake. And that's what I'm going to show up on the top now. And it doesn't quite agree. You actually get more uptake than we would get from the, from the, that we inferred before. Um, I'm just going to blow that up. So let me, let me remind you. So we're looking at the sum, and we're comparing the observations of the sum to a calculation that takes account of two things. It takes account fossil fuel burning, and it takes account of an independent estimate of ocean uptake of CO2. This sum is not affected by the land. So what's left that we haven't considered? Well, maybe the ocean's giving up some oxygen, right? One thing we haven't talked about is the possibility that ocean, oxygen's coming in and out of the ocean for another reason. It could be coming in or out spontaneously somehow. And so this offset here Is a, is a measure of, of the loss of oxygen from the oceans that we can, we can quantify. Um, and it's consistent. The rate is consistent with the ocean having lost about 0.8% of its oxygen content since 1981. There are other measurements of oxygen in the ocean that suggest that oxygen is being lost by the ocean at a similar rate. Now, we're talking here about dissolved oxygen as a gas. That matters. Think about an aquarium. You know, you've got fish swimming around in a tank. Most aquarium, unless they're a little tiny bowl, have something else. They have a bubbler, right? Why is that bubbler there? It's there so the fish don't suffocate, right? Now, there are fish in the ocean. How come they don't suffocate? 
There's no bubbler in the ocean. They don't suffocate because there's a big sea surface that's in contact with this big reservoir of oxygen in the atmosphere, and the ocean's being stirred. So there's oxygen being stirred down. There's no bubbler, but there's something else that's providing the oxygen. And if the ocean's losing oxygen, um, that could potentially be an issue for fish, not at the surface, but deeper down, where they depend on this mixing process. And so there's this, this issue has raised concern. As I said, there's other evidence for it. And from the atmosphere, we can, we can start to see evidence of it. Why would the ocean be losing O2? This is basically uh, work done by uh, colleagues here in part, uh, Corinne McCare and others. <laughs> um, it's a good, good oceanography problem to try, to try to understand this. First of all, warmer water tends to have less oxygen dissolved in it. Um, when you heat up tap water, it often forms little bubbles. That's because it's less soluble in warmer water. Like when you heat up water in a pan, right? First thing you see is little bubbles. It's not boiling yet, but you already see little bubbles. What are those bubbles? They're gas coming out because the warmer water has less air in it and less oxygen in it. That's one thing going on. Um, uh, and then, and, and, and of course the ocean is warming. The ocean's warming because the whole planet's all warming. So that's basically going to make the ocean have less oxygen. There's, the other effect is that if you warm the ocean as we are from above, the water at the top of the ocean floats better on the deeper water than it did before, so the ocean is actually becoming more stagnant. So this, this, this bubbler that's mixing oxygen downward or this, this mixing process becomes more sluggish. Um, so uh, there are other things that could be driving it, but um, the, 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 the environmental concern here is, that there, is mainly that there are parts of the ocean where the oxygen's already quite low because the stirring process, and those places are poised to grow in aerial extent, even if the ocean loses a, a few percent of its oxygen. So it's quite, they're quite, the, the area of those regions are quite sensitive to small changes in oxygen amount. So whereas we don't have concerns about loss of oxygen in the atmosphere, the fish in the ocean do have a problem about loss of oxygen because the ocean's getting warmer and the circulation is slowing down. And we can see evidence of that going on in the atmosphere. And this, this goes under the heading of ocean deoxygenation. It's one of the, on the, on the catalog of, of concerns about climate change that, that, that uh, deserves attention. So I'm kind of summarizing now. So what do we see from the atmosphere? We can see that CO2 is increasing, of course. I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. But um, we can see that the total amount of biomatter on land is increasing. That's now kind of irrefutable, even though it was initially hard to uh, accept. Um, we can see that photosynthesis of land plants is increasing. Um, the exact rate of that is less well quantified, but I think that trend is clear. And we can see that the ocean is losing O2. Um, this is not everything that's happening to the planet. Getting back to my preamble, there's a lot more going on. This is just what we can see at the big picture. This is what I have learned personally from the kind of measurements that I've been doing. Um, oh, I, want, I want to say something about this. Is this good? Are these things good or bad? I haven't placed a value judgment on these things very much. And I would point out that biomatter increasing and photosynthesis increasing on land sound like good things, but maybe we shouldn't be so sure about that. Um, the, the, the effects of CO2 in the ocean are, are treated as, as negatives. Um, and it, an interesting contrast can be drawn here about how we talk about the ocean and land in this, consequence, in, in this context. So, um, when we, when, we, when we think about land affecting carbon and climate, we think of the land basically as something that can be monetized. We can manage the land to reduce carbon dioxide and that has value. And, so, and we also think of the fertilization of land as a benefit. So we think of these things in sort of positive terms. And even the term CO2 fertilization has a positive sound to it. In the ocean, we think about First of all, the ocean is basically a hands-off system. People don't own most of the ocean, so there are laws that protect the sea against intervention, so there's a hands-off approach. And we tend to look at CO2 as an agent of harm. And from my perspective as a scientist, I don't see the logic of this very compellingly. Um, perhaps we should be doing things with the ocean to solve this problem and not just the land. And furthermore, just because CO2 is affecting plants by making them grow faster, that's not altogether a good thing. I mean, we are changing the um, 
landscape of winners and losers on land. The plants that will flourish, the plants that will perish, we are doing that in all sorts of profound ways. We are doing it because we're changing climate. We're also doing it because of a direct effect of CO2 affecting some plants more than others. So this has also potential to do harm. So we shouldn't think of an ecosystem that has more carbon in it as just the same ecosystem with more carbon. No, it's a different ecosystem. You can't have an ecosystem take up carbon and be the same ecosystem. It's a different beast. So there's, 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 there's changes going on there that, that, that need to be thought through. Um, finally, my last little content, I want to get back to this record. Um, this record is special because and among other things, it shows such steady change. We live in a time when the planet is changing, temperatures are warming, storms are changing, but most of those other measures of change are episodic, or at least we experience them epi episodically. What's special about this is every year it's going up almost. It's relentless. It's, it's like if you could measure human population, it would, it would be marching up like this. So it's really remarkable that you can go out on the planet and see something that's so precisely tracking our influence on the planet. And yet, this curve doesn't quite carry the important, fully carry the important impact. And the reason is, it doesn't change. At least over my lifetime, this church, this curve, even though it's going up, there's, in some ways it hasn't changed. So if you took the first half of the record, zoomed in on it, and then blew it up, what do you see? The curve is still going from the lower left to the upper right-hand corner with acceleration. It's the same curve. The only thing that changed is now the seasonal cycle is bigger because it's, the, the, the rise is a, lot, is a smaller fraction of it. But the visual impact of the curve is kind of static even while the system is changing on us. So it's helpful to actually to focus on the numbers. So let's look at the actual numbers. So I'm going to zoom in on the last few years of the monthly Mauna Loa record. 2013, the maximum value in the year is in May. We almost but didn't quite make it to 400 parts per million. And finally, in, in 2014, we got over 400 parts per million. Um, some people may, may remember that event. Um, then in 2015, the May value, uh, we got up to 404 parts per million. It's going up, right? OK, it's going up a lot. Um, 2016, 407.6, 2017, 409, almost 410. Finally, in 2018, we break 2010 or up to 2011. Where are we going to be in May of, of 2019? Well, we probably won't make it to 415 parts per million, um, but we're getting close, uh, and I'll say more about that in a second. Um, so how should we react to this? Okay, it's just going up. Business as usual, eh, another year. No, that's not how we should react. We should react like this. No, no, that shouldn't happen. Damn, no, ouch. <laughs> okay, so this is not normal. Okay, this shouldn't be going on. I mean, this isn't sustainable. We're moving, in, we're moving very rapidly into strange territory that we know nothing about, really. Or we, 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 can, only, we can only make, uh, we don't know nothing about it, but it, it's, 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 it's pretty un, unclear where we're headed, and it's dangerous. Um, so finally, let's look at the last few years of the Mauna Loa and, and zoom right on in. So this is, this is now showing not just monthly, but also weekly and daily averages for the last two years. You see the model or you see the record, the cycle, the rise. If you zoom in even closer, this is the last six months. All you see is this is this is what my father was seeing in the very beginning. He wasn't seeing the big picture. He was just zooming in and seeing little bits of it. Um, and if you look in the last week, um, you see that we have daily values. Those are those little black with bold black points, and we have uh, hourly averages that we <clears throat> fluctuate around. Um, we haven't yet had a daily value over 415. But we're getting really close, and it might happen tomorrow. So uh, there's now something like 15,000 people following these daily values. They're being picked up by news reporters as part of the daily weather forecast. It's about awareness. This curve can bring awareness of the rapidity at which we're changing our planet, particularly if you focus on the numbers. So thank you. <laughs>
uh, yeah, I really, really enjoyed that, especially all the um, kind of the, the the everyday examples to relate to the science was really great. Um, we have some time for questions from the audience. <laughs> uh, someone other than Karim to start, maybe. <laughs> Oh, why not, Karim? Well, let Karim start. Let But you have to be nice. Thank you. you have to be nice. Ralph, what we really want to know is what is your son doing? <laughs> or your daughter? <laughs> <laughs> uh, serious question. Yeah, serious question. He's getting, he's getting barreled of blacks, but anyway. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything to any of you. But. <laughs> OK. Um, satellite measurements now measure um, CO2, column CO2. Yeah. Um, do you think we're going to find or discover things with the satellite data that we don't already know with the CO2 surface? Yeah, absolutely. So that, what, 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 what this talk didn't uh, adequately illustrate is the explosion of additional data, with, particularly with more granularity, looking at regional changes and fine scale changes. And, and, and the, the approach here was to get a big picture with a holistic top-down approach. But you can also go out and measure things everywhere and get a holistic picture. And that's becoming more and more viable with time. And satellites are one way to do that. They're probably not the preferred way to track things over the long term, because they're expensive and they have calibration issues. They're just not as well calibrated. But if you wanted to say, well, what's happening in the middle of Africa with respect to carbon gains and losses? We don't have a good way to do that, but satellites might be able to do that. Other questions? Um, you talked quite a bit about the residual land sink and how your observations of oxygen helped to narrow it down, but you didn't say much about the importance of it in terms of whether it will continue in the future to take up a reasonable proportion yeah, of our yeah, yeah. emissions. Yeah, thanks for that. So um, the sink has been important to date in slowing the rise in CO2. It's unclear whether it will continue to do that. And I know a lot of my colleagues are skeptical, thinking that it probably will slow down. Um, after all, land can only store so much carbon. Trees bump into each other after a while. You can't have that many trees on a landscape before there's no room for more. Um, also, there are things that might kick in that turn the thing around. Like uh, if things get too warm, they might die because of some other problem. And yet, that's not what's happened so far. And I also don't think we have a very good handle on the potential upward potential of that. So <clears throat> I'm kind of thinking it's more interesting to speculate in the other direction, that things might get jungly. So I've given talks that have the title, Are We Entering a Jungle World? <laughs> okay, so I think it's more fun to speculate in the other direction. So I, I don't think we know. Hi, Ralph. Um, when you talk about the land biosphere, you talk about photosynthesis a lot. You didn't mention land respiration. Is that because it's... Well, let's see. Yeah, I didn't talk about that. So um, it's, kind of how, it's kind of like where you put your bottom, bottom line in a, an account. It's kind of an accounting question. Um, if, if you have photosynthesis, you're producing carbon. And if you're storing it, that's carbon that you photosynthesize that you didn't respire. So respiration is, is kind of being handled implicitly. Respiration is not going up as fast as photosynthesis. And that has to be the case because we're storing carbon. So there is, there is a story. You could, you could translate those numbers into, 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 if you knew how photosynthesis was changing and you knew how storage was changing, you could figure out how respiration was changing. So it is wrapped up there. Um, but for, respiration can't, respiration requires a supply of carbon. So it's not so useful to think of respiration as independent of these other flows of carbon. So from, from the standpoint of a mechanistic understanding of it, you have to include respiration. You also need to include fires, by the way. Um, so other things that destroy carbon. I don't know if I answered. Did, did, did that adequately answer you? OK. Can I follow up on the same yeah. point? But we know that respiration increases, the temperature increases, and the temperature is increasing. 
So that's the sort of a reason why we might expect respiration to be going up possibly even more than photosynthesis. That's right, but that's not happening. That's not what's happening. That's not, or that's not what has happened over the last few decades. That, that we can say with confidence. I was just going to ask is, if there's satellite um, evidence um, for this increase in carbon uptake to the land, so leaf area index, that kind of thing. Is, is there evidence for increased plant growth through, through yeah, that's, measurements? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, there is really good evidence that the, that, that the leaf area and greenness has gone up over large parts of the planet. Not everywhere. There are places that are browning. So it's, it's complicated. And it's also, you know, watching, it's not my field. Maybe you have some other experts in the audience who want to talk to this. But um, the estimates have not been super stable with time about what's actually happened. And every time, every few years, there's an update. You say, now we finally got it. And then five years later, there's another update. That, so I, I don't really know whether the dust has settled on this field yet. But there are pretty good indications that you see more vegetation cover over, like these boreal forests, particularly in Eurasia. Less, in, less so in North America, actually. But you see big changes. And you, see, you also see big changes in the, in the tundra ecosystems. There's something called woody encroachment. Basically, there's places that didn't used to have shrubs. They just had sort of mosses and things like grasses, and now they have shrubs growing. They have trees growing up. So th there's a lot of changes going on that you can document photographically and with, with, with other kinds of satellite reference, uh, measurements. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you for, for all those. That's very interesting. Is there any evidence of localized effects, such as where there's um, tropical deforestation? Uh, as in Indonesia or in the Amazon area, for example, uh, are there any major changes, effects there, which just have a local effect? Or does it all, all the whole atmosphere over the whole Earth, uh, more or less even out uh, as a dilution by the flows the, uh, of the the winds. Right. So that's a great question. So thanks for that. Um, from the standpoint of carbon dioxide uh, and the up, and really the other greenhouse gases, they're 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 being mixed sufficiently rapidly that the focus is sensibly on kind of a global average amount. So yeah, Indonesia can be releasing CO2 because of say fires burning. But that cloud of extra CO2 isn't concentrated enough over Indonesia to affect Indonesia's weather differently than, it, it may have an effect on the whole world, but it doesn't have a special effect on Indonesia. That, however, does not apply to other things. So, the, 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 for example, what's happening over Indonesia, there could be smoke coming up from the fires, and the smoke could filter the sun. That could affect Indonesian climate. Um, you could have effects on the hydrology. I mean, you could have more evaporation or rain, and that could, could rain out only hundreds of kilometers downwind. So you could get, you, you can get local effects like that, but you don't get them through, through the greenhouse gases. The greenhouse gases are acting at a very large scale, but many other climate influences are acting more locally. I hope that. Hi, thanks, Ron. So you presented this really valuable, detailed record from Mauna Loa. So I was wondering whether you think that the global budget now is more or less um, determined in terms of surface sites. Are there big unknowns that we can still identify from areas where surface measurements haven't provided enough information? It's a good question. Um, if you're interested, okay, so the, the basic question is do we, there's more than Mauna Loa out there. There's a, there's, there's a network of about 100 sites that are actually being used by the community for these for certain kinds of syntheses. And the question is, is that enough or do we need more? Um, it's clearly not quite enough to make inferences about carbon flows in and out of different, different areas where we don't have good coverage. But from the standpoint of documenting how much CO2 is actually in the atmosphere, we probably didn't even need that many. We probably only needed half a dozen sites. So to get, get, to get back to the question of, you know, do you have local versus global effects? No, you really only have global effects, and we probably only need half a dozen sites to track that. So um, 
It depends what your question is. If, if you care about actually knowing where carbon dioxide is coming in and out of the land and you're using the measurements to infer that, then you need more. If you're trying to just figure out, oh, what's the effect of CO2, or the current amount of CO2 on climate, you don't have to measure all over the place. Is that, is that? And related to that is uh, there's getting more and more interest about what's happening in cities. And for that, we need to measure in the cities. Right. Any, any more questions? Yeah, there's one here. Hey, um, with your method where you're deconvolving what the different, uh, the land and the ocean sink by doing the sum of the oxygen and CO2, when you're getting the ocean sink, um, you said that that doesn't affect the oxygen because it's just uh, solubility driven and it's a chemical process. Um, but can you actually pick apart land photosynthesis from photosynthesis in the ocean? Because surely that would also affect oxygen in the opposite way, just like land photosynthesis. Yeah, I mean, that's the, 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 the hardest thing to cover in this talk and still get this, the, the simple points across. So it's a perceptive question. Um, and and, and uh, it, the premise is right, that photosynthesis in the ocean also affects atmospheric oxygen. Indeed, I did point to that in the context of the seasonal cycles. In, in, but you say, well, how do we know that photosynthesis in the ocean isn't affecting the long-term trend? And uh, we don't, but... Uh, we can uh, infer, uh, how to say this, um, the, way, the way we've constructed, so, so photosynthesis in the ocean is also mostly a do-nothing loop, right? So you make carbon, it decomposes. So it's not so much photosynthesis that you care about, it's things that actually create some kind of closed loop that, that store carbon and, and, and pump it away from the surface, for example. And photosynthesis is part of that. And uh, we, at this point, don't have very good measures of the extent to which that's happening in the ocean. Um, and we don't have extent, very good measures of the extent to which those same processes are affecting oxygen. And I think that's an important research frontier. We do have, a, we do have some ways to cut into it with the oxygen data. And the sum gives, does give you a constraint on that, but it only tells you what's happening to the sum. It doesn't tell you what's happening to each one individually. And uh, on some time scales, the sum is mostly carbon. We know that. On some time scales, we know the sum is mostly influenced by oxygen. So right now, the, the, the narrative is kind of dependent on looking at time scales where we can say with some confidence which one is dominant on the sum. But there are, there are time scales where it's mixed up and we don't really have a, have a grade. And the, and the long term is also a little bit open-ended. Um, nothing that I did with the, the uh, sum variable with respect to land, ocean, carbon, sorry, with, with carbon and oxygen was 100% rigorous. I will, I will offer that as a caveat. Uh, maybe one or two more questions and one from Steph. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. This follows on quite nicely, actually, from that question um, about the oceans. I would take maybe slight issue with a, the fact you said there's a hands-off approach to the oceans in terms of what people are doing. Um, partly, I would say, like, we've removed a huge amount of biomass, for example, from the oceans over the last sort of, you know, 100, 200, 300 years. Um, which may have had an influence on the sort of carbon sink going on, like yeah, huge fisheries. amounts of the whales and the fish, and that, ha that hasn't been replaced by other biomass, so it would likely have some sort of an effect. Um, and people have also talked about uh, doing sort of algae growth fertilization as a way to take out CO2 from the atmosphere and increase the carbon sink as like future plans for stuff and whatever. Um, but yeah, mostly... I think less less hands on ocean than <laughs> maybe in my in my, my, my view anyway as a sort of marine marine scientist coming up from that angle. Good. I mean, I don't I don't disagree with any of that. So thanks for <laughs> add, adding that nuance. I guess I guess the only the the, the difference that people own the land but they don't own, own the ocean leads to a, 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 a quite a different kind of thinking about the land. But yes, there there, there are lots of interventions in the ocean that matter as well. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll finish there, so if we can all thank Ralph again.